Um, so in, in shifting gears, uh, we moved from Beijing uh, to Massachusetts and Boston to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, so <laughs> what we wanted to do was uh, we, we extend the, the New Literacies Institute and the model to work uh, with Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, and what we looked at is how we could use a blended learning environment using online and offline or face-to-face -face professional development experiences to work with our educators. Um, the rationale that basically motivates this work is something that has been a common thread throughout our talks today. Uh, one is that our schools need to adequately represent changes occurring to literacy as a result of technology. That's nothing new to anyone in this classroom. This is not a classroom, but you get the point. Uh, educators need to reflect on changes in pedagogy and practices uh, as a result of technology. We need to think about what, it, what teaching and learning means to us, to our students. One common thread I've seen uh, yesterday and today in sessions is we have deep uh, philosophical questions on the part of students and teachers about what it means to be a student, what it means to be a teacher. Um, and then individual teacher dispositions, once again, I believe are the key element in authentic, effective use of instruction, of technology and instruction. I think that's what we need to boil this down to. Our theoretical perspectives, at least for this work, are informed by new literacies, uh, research and theory. We have also an expanded view of text, and that includes all the work in multimodal design and multimodal formats, and then also teacher learning communities. And our research questions, what ways do teachers' perceptions about literacy change after attending or while attending a, a workshop or series of workshops on new literacies? What ways do teachers perspective, perceive classroom practices after these workshops? And then finally, what aspects of the PD series do teachers perceive as the most valuable in facilitating changes in belief or practice? Uh, the context that we used here, this is an extension of the work that you know, Hillary was describing earlier. We had the New Literacies Institute model, and we worked with teachers in Scranton and Dunmore, uh, two schools in Pennsylvania. And what would happen is on Saturdays, Greg and I would go up and we'd work with the teachers for five hours. In between those meetings, we would provide them opportunities online in a Moodle environment to go discuss and revisit a lot of the materials that we had. So there was not only the blended learning environment, but there was also an asynchronous element of the learning. Uh, and I think it was a positive piece because it allowed us to press pause on learning and the teachers after four or five hours of listening to Greg and I yammer on, they need a break. And so they had that break, they could go away for a week or two and think about things or medicate. Um, the daily format, <laughs> The daily format involved uh, an initial keynote and a discussion, and then we'd have guided practice on digital text and tools, DT and Ds, and then we had design studio time. One of the most important elements that Hiller brought up earlier um, is that cycle where you have time for the, for the teacher participants to work together. You need the design studio time. The best part of professional development is common planning time, common work time for teachers. Our keynotes focused on the online research and media skills curriculum that Greg talked about earlier. We define that as online reading comprehension, which everyone knows what that is about. Online content construction, I frame in my dissertation, and then I have, uh, after this, I have to write a chapter on it, on online content construction. That's basically students working together to compose, revise, and construct online content, which would range from blogs to you know text messages, gaming, wikis, everything else under the sun. And online collaborative inquiry is a group of students working together to collaboratively build and edit and revise a piece of text. How do I do this? Just, yeah, just click right there in the middle. Okay. Not on the side. You can see my level of technolo technology expertise. Um, we invited Greg and Ian to come to Marywood as part of a, a larger grant-funded workshop um, project that we were doing. Uh, we were working with three area high schools, two urban and one rural, and the project was designed to support, provide academic support for lower income students uh, who didn't have a lot of support at home. And we did this in two ways. One was through an after school and summer mentoring program where we had our graduate students take a look at what kinds of technology related literacies students were using outside of school and then bring those into a classroom setting and create a third space, if you will, 
um, to try to help support the students academically. So that was one piece of the program. And then the second piece of the program was to uh, work with the teachers, and that's what we were doing through these workshops. So our participants were from the three local high schools, and uh, we ended up with 23 teachers responding to our email invitation. And what's kind of interesting about these um, figures is that if you look at the average years of experience and average age of the teachers um, and, and you kind of make some assumptions, the teachers, most of them started teaching about 17 years ago, which would be approximately 1995. So if you think about the time of their training, that was just before the internet was really widely being used. I lied to you. I think technology. Uh -huh. okay. uh, Frank and I designed a pre and post test survey. It was a 31 item survey uh, using a Likert scale, and we did get some interesting results with that. Um, for the post test, we had two additional open ended items. Uh, if your classroom practice has changed as a result of the professional development series, briefly explain those changes, and then um, explain what aspects of the workshop facilitated the changes. Um, we also uh, looked at the forum posts that teachers did in between sessions, and then their final projects. The survey itself was, we looked at four different domains. One was literacy, um, looking at how they define text and how they saw literacy. Uh, the other domain was technology and the relationship between technology and themselves as teachers. Some examples are technology helps me to be creative in the classroom, it helps me to be more productive as an educator, and it helps to make my work more interesting. A third domain was the relationship between technology and the teacher's students. Um, for example, technology motivates my students to do better work, it causes my students to lose valuable skills, and it significantly improves the quality of education for my students. And then we also looked at technology and culture, um, mainly looking at what they defined as text, uh, what they defined as literacy, like um, books, text messages, songs, and so on. We tried to bring in some non-traditional forms of text. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, it's all here, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be Vanna. I'll be Vanna. Um, so it, it's, I, 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 we watched uh, the visual image of, um, measures of using the visual images, and it's so attractive. Um, we used the standard uh, four-point Likert scale, contrary to what Greg was saying. Uh, we, I think we did have folks who said they got dumber. That's because um, we provided a professional <laughs> So, I, But as you see, as we go through, um, it basically, um, you know, 31 items. Um, we only got to descriptive analysis of the stats right now. Uh, we didn't get to any inferentials um, as we move on. Um, and then also, um, the two uh, open-ended questions at the bottom um, were being coded uh, through Tammy and, and, and Greg. So um, we look at the pre-test, post-test averages. These are just folks rating themselves on a um, four-point Likert scale, one being strongly disagree, the four being strongly agree um, in the four domains. Um, and as, as we go down, the interesting part is, um, particularly as we move on, um, we see that folks generally agree in the progressive idea of literacy um, in terms of it's a collaborative type of um, definition. Um, in general, they agree that technology is good for themselves um, in, in the classroom. Um, we're not quite seeing that yet with the students. It, was that one not a reverse score? I reverse scored it too, and, and it I'll, we'll pull that up later, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, and we see a change in their belief of what, tech, or what literacy is in terms of DVD, book, um, text message, Facebook. Um, naturally, the teachers came in. They wanted, they said that they expected their classroom practice to change. 
um, you know, at, at the end they said they still expect it to change, and then they agree that it has changed. Um, but things, as we move on, you'll see the numbers when we start to look at them. Um, Pre-test, post-test, um, these, we see some nice growth in terms of their definition of literacy. Um, here, I'm not too concerned. It's a small change. Uh, the goal of reading is to construct meaning from text. Um, stays the same after, right? Um, and remember, on these items, one is um, strongly disagree, four is strongly agree. As we go to the next one, get to some neat stuff here. This is the one. Technology in the classroom, or technology in the classroom makes my life more difficult. So we don't have, and this was reverse coded um, when we went in, um, we don't necessarily have folks strongly disagreeing to this, um, or disagreeing for that matter. And um, we, we, were, we were chatting um, earlier, where, where did I put this? Job technology in the classroom makes my life more difficult. Um, they're, not, they're not seeing technology as making their life easier. Um, and um, we need to once again go back to the sample of folks that we used and that when they were trained. The time period of when they were trained and what they were forced to use when they were trained. Um, Pre-internet time period. Also, another interesting one, when we look at technology for the student, um, healthy, we're not concerned. I joked earlier that they actually said they changed. Um, small, small changes, but, but nothing to get excited about. But this one here, the overall picture that it's saying, uh, this is a reverse coded one again. Um, with the reverse coding, um, four would be strongly disagree, right? Mm -hmm. Um, three would be <coughs> disagree. So technology causes my students to lose um, valuable skills. And when we look at this one, once I find out, there were so many versions of this on the... Um, we, you know, as we see the definition of text expanding in the survey, um, or, or based on the survey results. Um, I don't know if the definition of practice is expanding with that. Um, and these folks aren't disagreeing to this statement, right? Um, and when, when, what, what Tammy and I, when, when, when we came, had these results come back, um, and, and this isn't my area, keep in mind, but um, Tammy, we, we started talking about are they are the folks who you guys were working with prescribing to the digital native theory, mm -hmm. um, and they're kind of stuck in that mode, um, and it's something that I think in a future direction that we would go, we would look into further in terms of surveying, maybe perhaps <laughs> through visual <laughs> images. Yeah. Um, also, it seems like maybe they were referring to students out of school literacies when we say that it causes students to lose valuable skills. Um, it could be like text messaging and things like that, that they could see that as, a, as an interference. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go for it. Wait, we got it. Here we go. Nice scores moving. Um, the, the professional development series, we see the teachers, um, their idea of what text is, is expanding, right? Um, in the, at least in a positive general trend. All right, so we have uh, trying to, looking at the data and trying to figure out the work that we conducted, where this leads us. Um, first of all, the, their perceptions of literacy, as Frank just mentioned, were broadened as they were introduced and they worked with. Uh, and I think the most important part is the fact that they were working with the various digital texts and tools. Um, I think one other element that we've seen, and it looks like this is a result that we're seeing across all of the different studies, is the fact that teachers need to work and develop and expand their own individual dispositions before we can focus on the pedagogy, before we can work on teaching and learning or think about teaching and learning. Um, I, what I appreciate was the fact 
that asynchronous learning environment, the blended learning environment, the ability to press pause on learning and, and come back to it later. And if we pay attention to the dispositions research, that so we know that dispositions and changing dispositions and building them takes time. And so maybe the online blended learning environments provide us that time. We also looked at, once again, uh, the role of, the, of time as a modifier in, in working with them. I expanded upon that on the last one. Uh, another piece of this was instructional barriers at the school level. In the, the latest group that we're working with, we made one of the teachers, actually all the teachers from the building, they made the comment that the, the school basically uh, disabled the right click on the mouse. Okay. Just got Google. I mean, so this is one of those challenges that we have is this great work that we're trying to do. We're motivating teachers and getting them ready to go out into the buildings. I can honestly say it is the most instructional barriers I have encountered in all the professional life. Done, done, done huh? What was the rationale? All those shortcuts, all those shortcuts can be bad. I worked in a school district that spent a lot of money on iPod touches, iPod touch cards, and then they literally sat there for hours and whited out all the camera lenses because they didn't want the kids taking pictures of each other. No, I, yeah, but this district, I've never run into more. So back to the study. Um, one of the things is the instructional barriers. We have to keep in mind when we're working with teachers, some of our teachers are going into these environments that technology is, is viewed and technology instruction is viewed as a subversive activity. And we have to prepare our teachers for that. Um, but I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Yeah. The other thing that was hugely important or, or slapped us in the face when we looked through it is, with all of the work and all the time, at the end of our time working together, it seems like most of the teachers were focused on just a creation of an online space. Putting a little house for themselves out there, a website, a wiki space. We'll get to the learning activities later, after the, the, the hours and, and the days and the ultimately weeks, it was basically, I've got an online space. I have an online presence, okay? Um, and so that brings us to implications. I think that, we need to take time to think about uh, one of the implications that I had there is that learning experiences like this, like the New Literacies Institute in Boston, you know, like the work that we've done with Marywood, possibly like the, the first paper, we need multiple institutes and multiple workshops and PD experiences like this. Going through, you know, one New Literacies Institute, that might be the starting place. Then you need to go through it all over again. Um, also, we need to take a look at the amount of face-to-face -face and online time uh, and time away from instruction and figure out what works the best for the teachers. What is the best amount of online time, face-to-face, -face, time away? How can we um, maximize the time and the learning with the teachers? Try to unpack that. We have to figure out how to scaffold learning and how to avoid that cognitive fatigue. Those of you that have worked in these institutes, if it's a week-long institute, you know by Wednesday at about 12.30, the teachers look at you like, just get away from me, okay? <laughs> How do we try and work and manipulate the schedule and scaffold our learners to try and eliminate the cognitive fatigue? For that example, is a big we problem. Learned, we learned after the first year that we did design studio in the afternoon on Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday, we do it first thing in the morning because they just, they're gung-ho, but by Wednesday afternoon, they're done. So we just, we would move the design time first. And then Thursday you dance. Yes. I still have a video. And then I think what we also need to do is research. We need to take a look at the online, uh, about, uh, take a look at the PD, take a look at the workshop or the institute, and then go back to their classrooms. So exactly what you were talking about. We need to go back to the classrooms and figure out, is this changing instruction? Are you doing this? Um, we had the privilege of, we have another group of teachers coming in now and we know that they went through our program and now we see them again and say, okay, what have you done? We can look at the learning artifacts, but we need to step into the classroom and figure out, is this making a difference or a change in what they have to do? So with that being said, how much time do I have left? 53 seconds. All right, good. So. I will say, at both indicators, what was great is six teachers wanted to return. And <laughs> that's great though, and that's a good percentage out of the original 30, that six came back. Um, and those demographic data, that is huge. I mean, we had, we started with